same power, same power, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is here today and lives in us. And there's nothing too difficult for God. I believe that. So my message is about today. Pastor Brett, that's a great song. Thank you so much. Hey, there is a great ministry that some of our people are involved in called Christian Motorcycle Association. And in just a moment, we're going to have you pass some cash to our ushers down the aisle. But I want you to watch the screen and pray for this ministry that is worldwide. Watch the screen, will you? I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be assured of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go into all the world. How is that possible? No person, no church, no organization can do that alone. And yet Jesus was very clear in this command. Only by working together and contributing as we are able will we complete the task. In CMA, we understand that we must do our part. We're not a fundraising organization. Run for the Sun is the only official fundraising effort we're involved in, and we give away more than we keep. None of the money raised is used to fund the day-to-day -day operating expenses of CMA or any other organization. CMA keeps 40%, which we use to reach out to bikers and others throughout the United States and around the world. We go places where others don't or won't go. We reach out in service and look for opportunities to let our light shine. We strive to demonstrate the unconditional love of Christ. Every year, CMA members represent Christ to more than two million people, exposing more than 500,000 to the gospel message, with approximately 14,000 of those making the life-changing decision to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. 20% of the money raised is used to support the work of the Jesus Film Project. The Jesus Film has been translated into more than 1,300 languages and shown in more than 200 countries. Historically, for every dollar CMA invests in the Jesus film, approximately 10 people see the film somewhere in the world and at least one accepts Christ. Using these estimates, the support provided through Run for the Sun has allowed approximately 110 million people to view the film with some 11 million of those making decisions for Christ. These decisions are a direct result of CMA's Run for the Sun. 20% of the total raised is used to support Missionary Ventures International, where CMA has placed more than 6,500 bicycles, 5,500 motorcycles, plus boats, horses, buggies, snowmobiles, and at least one camel to pastors working in more than 100 countries. Right now, there are more than 12,000 pastors, evangelists, teachers, and Christian leaders equipped with efficient transportation doing their part to fulfill the Great Commission because of CMA's Run for the Sun. 20% goes to Open Doors, supporting their effort to promote the gospel in countries where being a Christian can get you locked up or killed. One of the greatest challenges to Christians living under tyranny and loss of religious freedom is isolation from God's Word and from the body of Christ. Through Open Doors, CMA supports and strengthens suffering believers by providing Bibles and gospel development resources, by supporting the advancement of women and children, and through Christian community restoration efforts. CMA's Run for the Sun is a place where you can invest and know that you'll be participating in something that will result in someone's life being changed. On the first Saturday in May, CMA members across the United States will participate in Run for the Sun. You can touch someone somewhere in the world for Christ, but the choice is yours. Will you support CMA's Run for the Sun? So if I could have some guys help me, we'll pass out and do a dollar blessing, five, 10, 20, whatever you want to do. And if you need to write a check, just make it to New Hope Assembly and on the envelope put Christian Motorcycle Association, if you would, so that we can get that to them. Also today we have James Audra, Jake and Emily Slight, their little new grandbaby, first time here. We want to welcome uh, James. Huh? Jake and Emily's baby. Did I say grandbaby? Oh, I was thinking about, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say Larry and Jenny's grandbaby. Where's Larry and Jenny? Are they here today? I'm not sure if they were here with the weekend, but God bless you. 
Stand up, Jake. Emily and Jake served our country. God bless you. Thank you for your service to the Lord, I mean to our country. God bless you guys. Congratulations. Hey, you know what? If I could grow hair like that, I wouldn't cut it off the side. I just, I just have it all over everywhere. Baby's got as much hair as you do. That baby does have as much hair as I do. I think that's not fair. But anyway, bless you. Thank you guys so much. Hey, there's a video I've got uh, that I wanted to show you. It's a, I know it's not Easter, but it makes a point because I think the church world has a, like Timothy said in the last days, having a form of, of religion, but denying the power thereof. And I think this kind of gives us a little snippet of what is uh, going on to try to make people come to church and have attendance. And while I don't, I'm not against your, you know, God speaks through personality. You can't be who you're not and all that kind of thing. But uh, this kind of takes it over the top and not that everything that he's talking about is wrong, but it's a humorous way of reminding us it's not by might or power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Take a look at this video. Okay, everybody, listen up. This is Easter. Shuttles and golf carts in the parking lot. Now, has everyone in here, staff or volunteer, shared our graphically designed Easter invitation on their personal Instagram? This is for the kingdom. Who is trimming these hedges? A youth intern? For heaven's sakes. No, we don't have ministry time. We do have a petting zoo outside, though. And connect cards, connect cards, connect cards. Do we have the right mixture of haze in the fog machine? I mean, we don't need new members, but did we get the rose petals in the visitor parking spaces? We are pro-Jesus and pro-Easter Bunny. Donuts, check. Coffee, check. Make sure we have gluten-free communion, fat-free communion, Whole30 communion, vegan communion, paleo communion, non-GMO communion. Honestly, everybody needs to keep their phones out because I will be saying some very tweetable quotes this morning. The Easter basket is full, but the tomb is empty. He can put your life back together when it is in pieces, and some of y'all are still focused on Reese's. We need more diversity up on that stage. This is Easter. No, the youth pastor cannot do announcements. What about that one minority guy that came one time? Can we get him to do announcements? We don't want any visitor to feel uncomfortable in any way at any time, but we will ask him to fill out a connect card with their children's names and ages. I don't care what size the stage is, Becky. I need a rapper up there, a full choir, and six men dressed as Roman centurions. Why would you even ask about the worship set list? It's Jesus paid it all, Christ alone, Christ is risen. Can we just, can we get that other worship leader that's a little bit more attractive? This is the best great team we have. Who trained these people? For one Sunday, please, can you just not be weird? Can we put her at the auxiliary door? Quit your ministry. Move these people out of here. We got a service starting in 15 minutes. Make sure all the visitors know that they are under no pressure to give, okay? But we'd love to see them come back, and if they do come back, we're starting a series on giving next week. <laughs> Get out of here. People are coming for the next service. <laughs> this sounds familiar, doesn't it, for those of you that have been, oh, my goodness. I felt a little convicted a couple of those things there, but <laughs> take, take your Bibles and be ready for uh, some, some scriptures that I'm going to give you. We're going to start... Uh, uh, in Luke uh, 24 is a verse I want you, if you're going to take one home, Luke 24, 49, and then I want to have you jump to Acts chapter 1 and 2. Uh, but, but really, churches try everything possible to build their attendance, to attract new people because they don't have the real power. Okay. Now, I'm going to get loud, so I feel like my voice is already really loud right now, so I don't know if it's too much. Be, be, just be careful. I don't want to hurt anybody's ears. But what is that real power? What is that authentic power? Let me tell you what it is. It's God himself that has revealed himself upon this earth for the dispensation that we live in by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe in God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen? And it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead that is available to every person that Christ Jesus calls. It's the power of his spirit to accomplish his purpose on earth, and that is ministry uniquely and individually through different people. This power is the overwhelming, melting, delivering power of the Spirit. And, and the same Spirit that anointed Jesus Christ when he went about doing good and healing and delivering people and casting out demons and, 
and declaring things. The same power of the Spirit that was upon the disciples when they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have in the, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. It's the same power when their shadow would rest upon someone, and that shadow had power. And I'm going to tell you, God is the same as a basic doctrine. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same. God doesn't change. And the Spirit of God has been here and was here in the moment of creation and has not changed. And He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, has all uh, wisdom and knowledge, every, anything and everything He knows. So that same Holy Spirit is here today, right here. In fact, it's the very reason that Jesus told his disciples, I've got to go away from this earth. Because if I stay on earth as, as born of, as the Son of God, as fully human though not God at all, and fully God as though not human at all, if I stay on this earth like this, then the Holy Spirit won't come. I must go away that I can send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He will guide you into all truth. He will convince you of right, righteousness and judgment and of sin, and, of, and, and, and he will lead you. He will empower you to be witnesses. He will give you boldness. Jesus knew the importance. In fact, he even said to his disciples that but when the Spirit comes and abides in you, greater works will you do by the, that Spirit of God than even I did. And I'm telling you, we are shortchanging ourselves. If you go back a couple of Sunday nights ago, go on live stream. And because if you hit live stream at the bottom of the website, all of a sudden a, a, a page of the services will come up. And on a Sunday night, I preached and I told about some of the things that went on and quoted Smith Wigglesworth. You got to hear it because I'm going to tell you, God does miraculous things through common people, regular people to say that it's not about you. And when a person is doing things and they want to get the credit and they're trying to be somebody, then I'll tell you what, God is not happy about that. In fact, I think a lot of times that's the antidote to the real thing. And I'm telling you, you don't have to know anything about what the Bible says happens when the Holy Spirit fills you and empowers you because when the Holy Spirit gets ready to do it, he's going to do it. I was raised by a dad that was raised Southern Baptist that didn't really much into Holy Spirit filling and power, and he questioned it, though my mother knew about it. And to be honest with you, just because you experience it, if you don't walk in it, if you don't walk in the discipline of prayer and the Word and of the Holy Spirit and pray in spirit and pray with understanding, if you're not walking in it, then you could have had an experience a long time ago and be dry as can be. Because one thing we learn from Dr. Nunley is you leak. And you need a daily. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine where it is excess because it's a cheap substitute for the Spirit of God. You don't need anything to cause you to relax. You don't need anything to cause you to forget your troubles. You don't need anything but the power of the Spirit of God to give you joy and give you celebration and make your life full and abundant and, and, and just amazing. You don't need it. You got Jesus, you got the fullness of the Spirit. It is greater. If you haven't experienced it, if you, if those of you that have had those moments, it is the greatest thing. It's beyond explanation. It's better than ice cream with strawberries on it. If you never tasted that, you know how good that is in the physical realm. Well, this, the spiritual realm, it's beyond ability to explain how great it is when the Holy Spirit himself, the third person of God, fills you up. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a person, and the Holy Spirit is God. 1,700 years ago or more, the Nicene Creed was written by the church fathers, and it's biblically sound as it can be, backed up in Scripture. And about the Holy Spirit, that Nicene Creed said this, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, which proceedeth from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. You wouldn't dare take and put a human's name there. You wouldn't say, I believe in Moses, the Lord and giver of life, which proceeds from the Father and Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. You can't put any human being there, not King David, not Paul, not Billy Graham, not anybody. It's the Holy Spirit. It's just not right, and you know it. A mere man cannot be inserted into the Holy Trinity. It's about God, and there is no equal. He is God the Holy Spirit along with God the Father and God the Son Jesus Christ. 
Psalm 139 verse 7 says, Whither shall I go from thy presence, from thy presence, from the presence of God? Whither shall I go from thy spirit, rather? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? And it goes on in that psalm and it lists all kinds of places. Here, there, here. And He's there, he's there, he's there, and he's here, and he's there. He's in you. If you have Jesus in your life, he's in you, but you may not be aware of him. You may not be stepping aside and letting him be full in you and letting the fullness of the power reveal himself to you. He's among us, and he's in you. If you invite Jesus in your life, because Jesus comes into your life by the Spirit. You see, it is that the Spirit baptizes us into Jesus, into new life. That's what it says. I told you that the last Sunday or the week before that, that we are baptized by the same Spirit into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, so that we are one by the Spirit. And then Jesus, the Bible says, baptizes us into his Spirit, in the fullness of his Spirit. John said, I baptize with water, but there's one that comes after me, and greater is he. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, God is on the throne. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, and he's making prayers for you. And Jesus has sent back this Holy Spirit, and the only thing of the Godhead is the power of his Spirit. He is what's on this earth. He works through us. He anoints us. He uses his, gives us the fruit. He uses the gifts in us. He gives us calling, and he gives us purpose, and he gives us power to fulfill all of it. And the Holy Spirit is here today. I believe it with all of my heart. And the Holy Spirit, like the Father and like Jesus the Son, is eternal, meaning had no beginning and has no end. He was here in creation. The Bible makes it clear in Genesis 1. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, and even at the baptism, it says, go and preach this gospel and, 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 the, and repentance in my name and, and, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just try adding in the name of the Father and the Son and Pastor Hawkins. As wonderful as he is, we know that's not right. No disrespect to Pastor Hawkins. He's the best looking. He's the strongest. He's the smartest. He's the most silver-tongued. He's all of that. You know what I'm saying? But it's not about us. No matter how great you are, it's about God and it's about Jesus. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. And you know, he habits the praise of his people. You get the praise in Jesus at the close of this service and the Holy Spirit's gonna show up. And at the close of this service, I hope you'll come here seeking more God. Because see, we live in a world that's so natural and we miss the eternal spiritual thing, the invisible stuff. And I'm telling you, there's something real about this. I knew nothing, just like in Acts 2, they knew nothing of the Spirit of the Lord. I knew nothing of it. And I was sitting there, and I'm telling you right now, no one had told me. I, nobody told me Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda. I didn't need any kind of starters like that. Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda, 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 Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda. You know, no, that's ridiculous, stupid, foolish, ignorant stuff. I knew nothing. I was waiting. I said, simple, no emotion. God, if this is real, if it's all you, I just want it. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit began to come, and I just felt this, this, power, this glory, this something that came all around me and came in me and suddenly out of my mouth I began to speak a spiritual language that I never, I didn't know what I was saying. Just like the Bible says, he that speaks in a spiritual language doesn't even, doesn't even know what he's saying. He's speaking to God. He's speaking, he's speaking to God in mysteries. And so we pray in the spirit, we pray with understanding, we sing in the spirit, we sing with understanding and that's a, a power of God that comes. See, when we were first born, we were born into a world of a material world, world, a world of matter. Our body is material, the earth is material, our matter, all we can see in the physical realm is material, it's part of the material world. And the material world weighs something, it can be measured, it yields to gravity, uh, it has shape, uh, it, it, you know, and we're born and it, we exist partly in a material world. It's one mode of our being and of our existence, but there is another, and it's spirit. And man well, had a spirit, but it's a fallen man, a fallen spirit, and we gotta be born again. People say, well, I can't help it, I was born this way, you know. You don't tell me that's wrong, I was born that way. Yeah, I was born that way. Well, you were all born that way. You were born thieves and liars and robbers and lustful. 
You were born in all kinds of sin, and that's no excuse. Let me tell you what the excuse is. The excuse is that we don't know the power of God to change a heart. And when you're born again, you're born by the Spirit, and God's Spirit takes the Word of God, and with power, He like a two-edged sword, the sword of the Holy Spirit, He takes and stabs you, and He kills that old dead spirit of you, and you're dead, and you're trespasses and sin, and you're done, and you're made alive in Christ, and His Spirit comes alive in you, and there's a new desire and a new power to live for God and for his purposes and a new glory that God will give to you. We're born, yes, material, but we're born again, spiritual. And the spirit, the spirit exists, the Holy Spirit can penetrate everything. And at the close of the service, I'm inviting you to open yourself up, to get out of your seat and come quickly and say, Holy Spirit, penetrate my being that I can know this invisible power of God that picks me up from my weakness and my whining and make me powerful in the Spirit and that I can be used of your divine calling and purpose in my life that you will equip me and make me powerful and anointed like Jesus of Nazareth was with that same Spirit that there'd be a difference because there's a lot of people that you love and that I love that are good people in many ways, but they're lost. They're blind. They, they, they look at religion from words. They look at religion from theological perspectives. They're trying to be convinced through apologetics, but let me tell you the convincing power is the Holy Spirit where the Bible says the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit or with you that you're the child of God, and you know it, and the Spirit will reveal and exalt Jesus and convince you that He is the Messiah. Nobody has to talk you into it. When you experience the reality of salvation by the power of the Spirit that changes your heart, you know without a doubt that Jesus is the Christ. I know who I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep me from that day. No matter what come in this life, the Holy Spirit will convince you with infallible proofs beyond that which you can ever find in, in an apologetics book or teaching. Now, I think apologetics is good, and study of the Scripture is good, but there's something even better, and that's the convincing and the power of God's Spirit to reveal to you that Jesus Christ truly is Messiah. See, the Holy Spirit's not matter. He's substance. He has a will. He's a person, God. He has intelligence. He has feeling, knowledge, sympathy, ability to love, to see, to think, to hear, to speak. The desire has desire, the same as any person has desire. He can be grieved and is often by those of us that say our call on the name of Jesus and represent Jesus and take the Holy Spirit places he doesn't want you to be and does things he doesn't want to be a part of. He's grieved. He can be quenched because the ministry has called you to and he wants to desire to flow through you and empower you that you, you turn away, you don't acknowledge, you're not tuned in, you're not, you're not, you're not uh, seeking, you're not uh, open to the moving and to the, to the strength of the Spirit to reveal himself through you. Holy Spirit has all the characteristics of God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. And when you read about Jesus, you read about God the Father, then you know in a surety that it's also true about the Holy Spirit. Well, the first thing I want you to see is the promise of the Father in Luke chapter 24, 49. And this is the one you want to write down. The promise of the Father, he's among us. He wants to fill and possess us. The promise of the Father is the Spirit. Jesus said these words. Behold, I send forth the promise of my Father. It's the promise of my Father. And look what he says. But tarry ye in the city until you be clothed with power from on high. That's to his disciples. That's the same thing we'll see in just a minute in Acts chapter 1, where he said to wait. And see, the promise of the Father was spoken of in Joel chapter 2, prophesied centuries ago. In 2, 28, 29, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. You think the Bible's a sexist book? It's not. Your daughters, male or female, go back to my message on marriage and you'll find out the name Adam means mankind. Okay? It's wrong for people to oppress women or put down a woman. I don't know why I'm saying this. this is not even close in my notes. But if you're a women hater or a women oppressor or a dominant to women and you don't respect women, you're wrong. You're wrong. 
Women, women are equal with men. They're not, there's no male nor female in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. No Greek nor Jew. No bond, no slave. And by the way, there's no, while I'm on it, there's no uh, social status. There's no racial status. There's no um, educational status in the kingdom of God. We're born by the spirit of Christ in us, and we're all before God the same. We need his mercy, and we need, have the power and ability to walk in his spirit. And so he says, uh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men, see, he's not even prejudiced against old people, shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions, and it's also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I'll pour out my spirit. In Acts chapter 1, 4 to 8, we see Jesus is being assembled together with them. He, as understood, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. There it is again. Which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when there, therefore they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you this time, are you going to at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were talking about an earthly kingdom. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Gets back to the subject. But you will receive power. Talking about kingdom power, national power, worldly power. That's not what he's talking about. He says, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, it happens in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. There's a wind that blows. There's to to cloven tongues of fire. They, they begin to speak, as the Bible says, in uh, tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. And I'm not talking about spiritual language today at all. That's not the point. Because here's our problem. We get focused on spiritual language and we miss God. You don't need to get focused on spiritual language. Get focused on God. Get focused on needing more of God. Get focused on that God, whatever way he wants to do it today in you, that he has a power for you and he's willing, welcome, and wants to. And he is, he is more eager than you ever thought of to fill you up and change you and show himself to you in such a way that you never, could never dream possible. And it goes on and it says they begin to speak these languages and people begin to hear them speak in this language and that language. And that. They go, well, they don't even speak that language, but they're speaking in my language. They don't know my language. How do they know that? And they're praising God and they're telling all about God's wonderful works and they're all in wonderment and they're in amazement. And some of them were a little bit confused and they thought, well, it's only the third hour of the day. It's early. It's the morning time. These guys are already drunk. They're acting drunk. They're drunk. You know, with wine. What's wrong with these people? And then Peter stands up. Yeah, chicken Peter. The Peter that was afraid until the Holy Spirit came upon him. The Peter that whacked like a little wimp into a, a little girl that says, you're one of those followers that you know I'm not. I don't know him. Leave me alone. Remember that little Peter? Remember him? Chicken Peter. He stood up in front of everybody. He says in chapter Acts 2, verse 11, the second part of verse 11, he says, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another, verse 12, what mean is this? Verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. And Peter, standing up with 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these aren't drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'm gonna pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions. Who's he quoting here? Joel. Is he quoting Joel? I just read Joel 2, 28, 29, right? Why? Because when I tell you something, we're weak need and weak-minded in America as Christians because by the time they get to Bar Mitzvah, a 13-year-old boy that was Jewish, he could quote the Pentateuch, which means five books of the law. He could quote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He could quote all 150 of the Psalms, and they could quote the all 15 prophet books of the Old Testament. And so here's Peter that's got this tucked away, and he remembers, and he sees what's happening, and immediately it comes to him. This is what's spoken by the prophet Joel, verse 16. And it shall come to verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He's quoting it. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You see, he didn't have it like this. See what I'm saying? He didn't, he didn't pick up the scroll, you know, there weren't that many. He didn't pick it up and start reading it. He knew it in his heart. 
And he says, your sons, your daughters will prophesy and your young men shall see visions. Sound familiar? Your old men will dream dreams. And on your servants, on the handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And when Jesus came to earth, you know what he did? He gave an authoritative interpretation of Joel's prophecy that was given by the God the Father centuries ago. And Jesus clearly communicates his intention for the church. He never intended us to get saved by the skin of our teeth and walk around like weaklings. There is something more that he has for us. And I'm telling you, there is a reality of the fullness of God's spirit. Now, I want you to forget what happened to them. And I want you to realize that all you got to do is come sincerely seeking. In fact, some of you, you're not ready to have any Holy Spirit filling today at all. In fact, some of you don't even want to have the Holy Spirit filling because you don't want to be led by God in giving, led by the Spirit. I had a young couple tell me their story just recently in our missions convention that the Holy Spirit they thought said give $500. Well, if we could do that. That was no nothing. So they, go, they thought we can do that. Well, they'd gotten back a tax return for over, a little over four and thousand dollars, something like that, and they planned on putting that in an, ed, an education fund for their children. And the, the, so they were sitting there and praying, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him, said, said, no, I mean 500 per missionary. Well, that day there was five missionaries. No, both Sundays, that was 10 missionaries. 500 times 10, that's 5,000. That's all our tax return plus some. Okay, God, write out the check. Now they intended to put that tax return in an education fund. Shoot down the road about six weeks, and all of a sudden the check comes for $5,000. No one related, not anybody related. It says, we just felt led to send this to you. Would you put this in your children's education fund? Now, let me tell you something. I don't believe in push button giving. You push this button, you give, and here comes out comes the same or the more. I don't believe in that. I've given and sacrificed, given ten thousand dollars before, and I never got any ten thousand dollar check in the mail. <laughs> you feel led? Well, hallelujah! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hallelujah! Woo! Well, I tell you, the Holy Spirit will start moving in. Woo! 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 No, I'm just kidding. I'd give it to speed the light. Anyway, so I'm just telling you guys. There are a lot of people, they don't want the Spirit to, to lead them and guide them. They'd just rather give the, the letter of the law to the tenth, to the penny. I'll just give my tithe to the penny. I'll be doing that. I'll go to my church service that time. Oh, it's like one time, maybe Wednesday night, but that's okay if I miss this. It's, it's okay, you know. And, I, and I, I serve a little bit. I'll help out this a little bit, you know. And they do the religious thing. But they don't want to have their life invaded and empowered and led and full, right? And you don't want the Holy Spirit on your shoulders messing up your sin. You don't want them going everywhere you go because you know it's some of the things you're doing and thinking are not right. And you know, basically your vessel isn't ready to be full because your heart doesn't want God all the way, all the way, and you don't want the Spirit because His first name is Holy Spirit. He wants to clean you up so he can fill you up and empower you. And I'm telling you, the work of sanctification is by the Word of God, quickened by the Spirit. And you put this Bible, which the Bible calls the, the Word of God, the, the Spirit of the sword, the sword of the Spirit, rather, and you put that Bible quickened and anointed by the Spirit, and he'll change you. You say, I can't hardly help myself. And old Flip Wilson, he used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil, the devil can't make you do anything because Jesus is greater in you, just like the song we sang, and he is overcome by his spirit there's a power in you the enemy cannot overcome you you can be victorious you can be an overcomer in Jesus Christ it's just about being hungry enough and seeking first there's action words that are passionate words to cry out to God to call on God to lift your voice to God and you you know it was last Sunday someone's going oh God Oh, God, they're at the altar, they're crying out, oh, God. And that's what we have to have is a desire and an emotion and a passion crying out to God that he would do something deep in us and make something happen. I don't even want you to think about what happened on that day of Pentecost. Don't even worry about that. Just go after God and his spirit. He will show himself just the way he wants to to you. Now, the problem is in our culture today is that we've educated people and trying to convince people that religion is good because there's no reality of the power in convicting life of our life like old David Wilkerson when he would preach or he'd come up to you and he'd look through you and the Holy Spirit used to be so powerful you couldn't hardly stand in his presence. How many ever walked up close with face to face with David Wilkerson, a powerful man of God? I did. 
And I know, and I sense it's the first, only person in my life that ever sensed that much glory and power upon. You should read about him if you don't know him, young people. He's, he's, he's gone now. I'm assuming Smith Wigglesworth was the same. But you see, Jesus Christ is Messiah, and the Holy Spirit's job is to convince you of that. And there are, in the promise of the Father, there, there's the period of the promise. And this is from John the Baptist right to the ascension of Jesus when he went up in the, into the skies and disappeared. And the angel said, this thing Jesus you see going is going to come again just like you see him. He's going to come back again. And during that time, this is the promise of the Father. Jesus was creating expectation in his disciples all around his ministry. He speaks of the promise of the Father like we just read in Luke 24. He mentions that if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. He tells them about it. John the Baptist gives testimony and builds expectation in the period of the promise. That the promise is made, but it hasn't, been, it hasn't come to pass. And he tells uh, uh, Jesus tells them again, we read in Acts 1, right before, that's right before he ascends and before their eyes, he tells them to tarry or wait for the promise. And the promise of the Father from God is, is, is absolutely sure. He does not break promises. And secondly, you see the period of preparation. This was 10 days that they waited. When they waited and they were in one accord, they were waiting in Jerusalem, they were in the upper room. It was 10 days. Can you imagine that? 10 days. Well, they had just seen Jesus. They saw him raised from the dead. He'd been on earth for 40 days, and we know this day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1, the day of Pentecost had fully come. We know that's 50 days after Passover. And Jesus, the Bible says, was on earth after he rose again 40 days. So we know 40 from 50 is 10, and that's when the day of Pentecost came. So we know that when Jesus ascended, there was 10 days yet for the day of Pentecost to fully come. Do you get what I'm saying? So they're in there praying and fasting. Listen, you want more of God? Just try fasting. Just try praying. Just try hungering. Just try opening up. Just try waiting on God for 10 days. I'll tell you what, just suddenly something's going to happen to you. You know, they stopped their activity because Jesus told them to at the command of Jesus. They tarried. They waited. You're about to receive what you've been promised. Your expectations are about to be fulfilled. Don't do anything till the promise comes. And sometimes we can go farther when we're not going anywhere. We're just waiting. Sometimes you just you move faster when you're not moving at all. And sometimes you're learning more when you think you've stopped learning. See, Jesus had risen. The 120 were there. They were filled with joy. They saw them, and they believed they were full of faith. They knew that the promise of the Father, Jesus said it, and they weren't moving. Probably some of us would have, about six days into it, would have said, I, I got to get to work. No, not these guys. They were waiting. They were preparing themselves in the period of, uh, of what I called the preparation period. And then the third is the period of realization found in Acts 2, 1 to 4. And it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 50 days after Passover, they were all in one accord. And by it was one of the three uh, celebrations of the Jews where everybody had to come into Jerusalem. So they were there. They were from all different languages. They had all come in. And it happened. And they were one accord in one place. In verse 2, suddenly there came a sound. Boy, God moves that way sometimes. I've been in it before. There was nothing, and then sudden. It was just waiting. You've been praying. You've been waiting. You've been hungering. And then suddenly, suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. It's just a symbol of, of the power of God. You ever heard a tornado sound? It's like a roaring. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven, cloven tongues of the fire. Or split tongues it sat upon each of them and I believe the reason for that is the fire is the fire purifies it washes away dross or, or impurities fire cleanses impurities and second thing is that tongue is the most difficult thing to control the Bible says that he that can tame his tongue control his tongue is perfect in every way are you with me anybody perfect with their tongue you really got to be close to God all the time to watch that tongue and, 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 and so it, the tongues was o over them and set on them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the words or the utterance. In Acts 2, 33, Peter says this about the event. He said, he shed forth this which you now see and hear. God did this that you now see and hear. The promise is fulfilled, the period of re realization. Then the next thing is the evidence of the Spirit. You see, Scripture, the Spirit is the greatest evidence of Jesus' Messiahship and the reality of God and the truth of the Word, the Holy Spirit. 
But we have other evidences, and you can study. You can study ancient literature. Uh, you can study apologetics. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can look, and the first one is Scripture. John 5, 39 itself says, you study the Scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. And look what it says. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me, Jesus is saying. The Bible and all the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus declaring his birth, where he was going to be born, all of his sufferings, lots of them fulfilled. Again, the Scripture speak to and convince us, if you're honest, that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And this is real stuff. This Bible is true. And John the Baptist testifies. The second thing, John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb window there with the cross, with the dove, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Lamb that went on the cross and died, became sacrificed for us. And John the Baptist declares Jesus the Lamb of God and the, the Messiah. And, and third thing is God the Father says it in five, John 5, 37. The Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. The Father sent, who sent me has testified concerning me. God the Father says, Jesus is Messiah. And finally, the works of Christ himself. Jesus says in John 5, 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I'm doing, testify that the Father has sent me. You see, these are evidences that are external evidences. God recognizes these. Jesus used some of them himself right? But there is an inside job of the Holy Spirit. These four evidences are external uh, 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 by nature. They're not inside a man. You have to open the book and read it. It's external to man. An honest look at the external proofs that Jesus even used himself uh, are very convincing. Even looking at the church and its history and its healing and restorations and deliverances and building hospitals, its compassion, its schools, its caring for the, the, the world and, 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 and trouble and hung, hunger and everything else, giving dignity to women and how the church has cleaned up saloons and has delivered people and changed people and saved us from our sin. We must say this must be God that this book is true, that there is a reality of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, there's an internal evidence, a witness of the Spirit, a power. It's an immediate evidence of the inner life, God in us. And Jesus took religion out of the external and he made it internal. He made it where a person knows beyond all doubt that Jesus lives because he lives within their hearts. And just as a person know that they're physically alive, there is just that real of them that they're spiritually alive, that Jesus is alive in them. It's true. Jesus is alive, and we can know it because he lives, he lives, he lives in my heart. And so um, you can take the gospel of the heathens, for instance, in Africa, and I've seen it in Ethiopia, demon-possessed people. I've seen it. A Holy Spirit is so thick, and the Spirit is pointing Jesus. You preach Jesus. It's not done very good, but the Holy Spirit convinces people, and you, could, you don't, they, they couldn't even grasp logical arguments there and, uh, about the living Messiah, the Savior. They could never decide on logical grounds whether Christianity was of God or not, but you preach to them, and the Holy Spirit comes, and they will believe. They'll be transformed. They'll be convinced. They'll put away their wickedness. They'll change from evil to righteous and get happy about it. And then they'll learn to read out of a hunger for God and read the Bible and learn, and learn to write. And they'll study their Bibles and become pillars and leaders in their church and call and be, rise up and, and be the church and be powerful and transform totally with a total makeover, so to speak. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Holy Spirit that came in and changed their hearts. It's a new thing. God took the form of religion from the realm of external and made it internal and powerful. We try to use the external proofs. We say, well, look at this guy. He's a great ball player. He believes in Jesus. You should. This guy's great. Or this guy's a very wealthy businessman. He's very successful because he believes, surely it's right. He's smart after all. It's, I'm sure it's true. Or we quote Daniel Webster or Roger Bacon, and we, re and we write books to show that we, 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 we uh, write books to show that some famous scientist now believes in Jesus. Therefore, Christianity must be true. But that's not the New Testament way. The New Testament way, that's a pitiful, whimpering, drooling, 
appeal to the flesh that never was the testimony of the New Testament. You might satisfy the intellects of a man by external evidences, and Jesus used these to point. But let me tell you, he didn't leave us just with fact. He didn't leave us just with information. He came with the power of the Spirit, and he brought the word of truth, and he made it alive. And he pierced the hearts of people, and he convicts people of sin, and he comes in and changes our lives. He said, I'm going to send you something better. I'm taking Christian apologetics out of the realm of logic and put it into the realm of life. I am proving my deity, and my proof will not be an appeal to a president or a governor. The proof lies in an invisible, unseen, but powerful Holy Spirit that visits the human soul when the gospel is preached. It's the Holy Spirit of God, and he's here today, right now. Holy Spirit brought an evidence that didn't need logic. It went straight to the soul like a light. It pricked the heart like Paul said or Saul said when he was, uh, when he was uh, torturing and, and uh, ridiculing and persecuting believers. It pricked the heart. It pr preached deeply. And the last thing is that the penetration of the Spirit, and this is short. Are you ready for God's power to penetrate your heart? Remember I told you that the world is mostly matter, material world that we live in. But the Holy Spirit can penetrate all matter, can penetrate your body, your human spirit, your personality, your natural born tendencies to sin and desires. It penetrates it and it changes you and makes you brand new, born again by the Spirit. And if a man can be penetrated by thought, if, if, if a mind rather can be penetrated by thought, if air can be penetrated by light, then material things and mental things Spiritual things can be penetrated by the Holy Spirit. And there is this divine person, invisible, unseen deity, the Holy Spirit of God, that is a present, knowing, feeling, personality. He is the invisible from the Father and the Son so that he is also praised and responded to and has all power, knows everything, is present everywhere. And he suddenly, you could be transferred to heaven and God is there the same. If we can get a hold of this God, the Holy Spirit on earth, it wouldn't be any different because he is that powerful. And it would be like God is sitting right by you, holding you. You can sense it. It can be so thick you can cut it like you just feel like you can just touch it. You can cut it with a knife. And God is here. Will you bow your head with me? You could change your geographical location and you couldn't be any nearer to God because the Trinity is present. Jesus, the Son, and is the Holy Spirit is present and the Father is present and Jesus is present and, and, uh, and we're the church. He's in this church. He's in you if you've called on Christ. And if you haven't, all you gotta do is just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know you're headed to hell, then just say, God, Forgive my sin and be merciful. His spirit will show up. You don't have to play mental gymnastics and intellectual monopoly, as it were, about your spiritual life. You can experience Jesus' forgiveness and his power and his grace. That Holy Spirit, internal evidence of God, his spirit can happen to you by simply asking. Do you want it? Do you want the Holy Spirit to penetrate your heart? He'll get down into every cell of your human soul. He will impress upon you surety. Blessed assurance will be so real that song will never be sung again by you. It's impressed and stamped His image by His Spirit in your life. 